contrast it with the type of faith that the Lord almost always encountered during his earthly ministry. So in order to do that, we're going to go to John chapter 11 now. So take your Bibles, go to John 11. We'll come back here to the, the story in just a minute. In John 11, it's a story I'm sure you're very familiar with. It's the story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Okay? We all know this story, very familiar. Jesus has intentionally waited for Lazarus to die so that he could raise him from the dead and God would be glorified. And he doesn't hide this. He just tells his disciples straight up, this is what's going to happen. This is why. And then he goes to... He goes to um, Uh, To Bethany, in verse number 20, the Bible says, Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Thy brother shall rise again. Now, look how she responds in verse 24. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Now think about this. Jesus has just straight up told her what he is going to do. Okay? I'm here. Stop the funeral. Don't stop stop the funeral. Cancel the meal at the end. Well, maybe not cancel the meal at the end, right? (laughs) But we're not going to have a funeral. Thy brother, he's coming up. I'm here. Thy brother shall rise again. He was talking about solving their situation that they were dealing with right now at that moment. Okay? She was thinking about the resurrection at the last day. She was thinking more under the lines of doctrine. Well, yeah, Lord, I know that it, in the end he's going to raise. You know what I found? Sometimes it's easier to have faith in the doctrines of the Bible than it is to trust God in the daily situations we deal with today. I believe I'm going to heaven. Jesus Christ is my Savior. I put my faith in him. I believe that I'm holding God's word. I believe in the doctrines of the word of God. I believe in the Trinity. I believe when I die I'll be in heaven. Sometimes, though, it's easier for me to believe that than it is for me to put my trust in something or or to trust God in the face of some circumstance that is terrorizing me right now today. And that's where we often lack faith. It's not necessarily in the doctrinal part, although some people do. It's in the trusting part of our daily situation. God was, Christ was talking about the daily situation. And she was thinking, oh, yeah, Lord, in the last day. Notice how he responds in, uh, verse number, in verse number 25. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. Now look with me down. Let's go down to verse number 34. Verse 34, and said, where have you hid him? I'm sorry, where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, behold how he loved him. And some of them said, could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? So think about what they're saying here. Jesus is going to heal Lazarus. While he is on his way, people are around him, in a sense, mocking him, doubting him, questioning him. Unbelief. Now, Jesus often encountered this when he would go to heal someone. Before he did the miracle, he would always encounter people that were just kind of the, they're just kind of the hecklers in the crowd. Think of when he raised the young girl from when he raised the young girl, and he said, "She is not uh, dead, but sleepeth." What did the family do? They mo- they they laughed him to scorn. The Bible says, and that often would happen. And so he would he would prepare to do the miracle, and people would just not only not believing, but heckling and mocking and laughing. Verse number thirty-eight. Jesus, therefore, again groaning in himself, cometh to the grave. It was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said. Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Now think about what's happening here. Jesus gets to the grave. He's already told her twice now that he's going to raise him from the dead. And now he's ready to do it. He says, move the stone. And what does she do? She resists. Why? Because if Jesus... If she moves that stone and Jesus doesn't raise him from the dead, it's going to cost her something. It's going to cost her something. She's going to be mocked. She's going to be ridiculed. People are going to say, why are you dishonoring this man's grave? Why, why are you opening it up so everyone can smell the stench of your dead brother? What are you doing? 
And so because she was at that point where she had to trust God or else she was going to be in trouble, she resists. She didn't want to go any further. Okay, Lord, it's fine to talk about it, but no, no, that's, we're not moving the stone. Folks, God brings us to those places. And notice how the Lord responds to her in uh, verse 40. Jesus saith unto her, said I not unto thee. Martha, I just got done telling you that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God. He rebukes her lack of faith. And so finally they moved the stone, verse 41. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. It's almost as if the Lord is saying, this is a lot harder than it needed to be. <laughs> Verse number 43, and when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And when Jesus says come forth, somebody's going to come forth, okay? Yeah. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto him, loose him and let him go. So the dead guy comes out of the grave. God raises him from the dead. And then he's walking around shaking hands. And finally, what happens? Verse number 45. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had, what's that word? Seen the things which Jesus did, believed on him. They saw and then they believed kind of hard not to believe when the dead guy is walking around talking to you. Although there were still some people that still managed not to believe, and amazingly enough. They wanted to kill him because so many people were believing on him. Um, folks, this is what the Lord often encountered when he went to do his earthly ministry. He would go somewhere. He would say, I'm going to do this. People would laugh at him. They would mock at him. They would resist. He would heal. He would, he would save someone. He would help someone. And then, after they saw the miracle, they would believe. But in Matthew chapter number 8, we read of a man who he didn't see anything. That Roman centurion, he didn't see anything. He just believed. He just simply, with childlike faith, trusted that God could take care of his servant. Just speak the word, Lord. Folks, that's what faith is. According to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And yet, many times, we're the same way. As Christians, we tend to do the exact same things that the Jews would do. We want to trust in God after we see how it's all going to work out. And God wants to bring us to those places where we have to move the stone and trust in Him, and yet we're oftentimes just as unbelieving as the Jews are. We have to learn as Christians to have faith and trust Him. Just trust Him. I remember once when I was, uh, when I was uh, a young preacher boy, I got a ride with an evangelist to a, a winter camp in this car for a couple hours, and I was trying to pick his brain for, you know, good information. And I asked him, I said, Brother, one thing you could tell me, what would that be? And he just looked at me and just said, you can trust God. I just thought, <laughs> that was it. And you know what? That was the best advice anyone's ever given me. You can trust God. When you can't see how it's going to work out, when you don't know what's going to happen, you can trust God. Amen. Now, with this in mind, I'm just going to give you really quickly three principles about faith, and we're going to be done. I'll go, I'll go fast. First one is this. Faith often involves risk. It often involves risk. And we see that with Martha here, where when she is brought to the stone and she resists Christ, when he tells her directly, move the stone, and she doesn't want to, because it would have, she was, it would have cost her a lot if God didn't come through. And that's where God's going to bring you. That's where he's brought me. He's going to bring me other times in my life. That's where he's going to bring you. He's going to bring you to where 
if you, you have to trust him in a way in which if he doesn't come through for you, you are going to be in big trouble. Right. It's going to bring you to a place of risk. If, if there's no risk involved, what do we need God for necessarily? Now, we do all things by faith, you know. Everything we do, we do it through faith. But there are some things that require more, thing, more faith than others. Yeah. Amen? Right. You know, uh, there are. You came to church tonight, you do that through faith, but at the same token, there's not a great risk involved, necessarily, unless you missed the game, you know. Your team would have lost anyways, by the way. It's okay. But there are other things in your life that to obey, if God doesn't come through, you are going to be in trouble. I'll just give you an example. How about tithing? You know, God says, hey, I, part of my money is mine. Part of your money is mine. Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar and unto God the things that are God's, Okay. And you say, well, if I give the Lord what's his, then what if I don't have enough at the end of the month? And so there's a risk involved there. Right. And you have to step out in faith and say, okay, am I doing something wrong with this? I'm sorry, maybe I should step back. You have to step out in faith. You step out in faith and you have to say, okay, Lord, I'm just going to trust you. And some people do and some people don't. And the people that do, they come to church, and I don't know if you've ever had this happen. Have you ever had a need, and the Lord just provides it in some special way, some miraculous way? God's good. Amen? And they come to church, and they're all excited, and they say, hey, I just got to tell you about how the Lord provided for my need. And, and people are all ex are, are excited about it. And then you have someone who comes, and, or you have someone that listens to them, and they think to themselves, God never does anything like that for me. It's because you never let him. Because everything you do is, what can I do? What am I capable of? And when the word of God commands you to move forward by faith, you refuse because you're not capable of doing it. God is going to bring you to those places where you have to trust him, where there is a risk involved. I'll just give you an example. When you guys took us on for support, you stepped out in faith. You took a risk. God is blessed. Well, then you start, when you're building this building, guess what you had to do? Step out in faith. Amen. Amen. This is not a church that is, uh, that is not familiar with this concept. I remember when we started out on deputation. And it's great to talk about, oh, God's called me to go to the mission field and, and to plan and think and, and, and prepare. But then the day comes where you have to quit your job. And I remember we, we got rid of our house. We sold our cars. We sold our furniture. We... Uh, we quit our jobs, everything, and we set out on deputation. I took the money, I sold my cars for it, I bought an $8,000 motor home, 20 years old. And let me tell you, that was way more than this thing was worth. <laughs> and we started out, and, and I remember we, we had, we had uh, Lydia in the front seat, and she was three weeks old at the time. And we had all of our stuff gone. We're heading out on full-time deputation. God's going to provide our support to go to Columbia. And we, we were, first trip meeting was in Michigan. So we had to drive from Fort Pierce to Michigan. So we get on the turnpike, heading towards, heading towards Michigan. And all of a sudden, we get an hour down the road, literally an hour down the road. And smoke starts billowing out of the engine compartment. Air conditioning pump blew on me. No air conditioning. 110 degrees out. Baby is sweating profusely. Okay, keep going. Tire blows. Half hour later. Spend the rest of the day in Leesburg getting it fixed. That night, 9 o'clock at night, we're back on the road. Stay, in a, get, stay somewhere. Next morning, we're heading out. It starts getting hot again. Tell my wife, okay, we have an air conditioning unit on the top. Maybe if we ran the generator, we could run that. You know, because it was $1,000 to fix the air, AC pump, and I didn't have the, you know. And so... Okay, we're going to do that. So I go out to start the generator, which worked when we bought the motorhome. No generator. No AC. Keep going up the road. If anything that could have broken on that motor motorhome broke on the way up to Michigan. We got down through, got through Indiana, and I didn't realize this at the time, but if you ever buy an old 20-year-old motorhome that has a brand new roof, check the underneath the roof. All of, it had a lot of water damage that I didn't realize that it had. And so as we're going through Indiana, all of the wood underneath was rotted through, the fiberglass starts to pull off of the frame of the motorhome on the freeway. And I get, I pull onto the side of the road in the freeway and I'm, 
trying to screw the fiberglass back onto the frame, but the screws won't hold because the wood's rotted. So I think, what am I going to do? I can't, you know, it's going to fall apart on me. And so I pull into a Home Depot in Indiana. I don't even know where. And I go in there, and I'm just looking for something to hold it together. I come out with roofer's tape. And I roofer's tape the thing back together. And I take beige spray paint and spray paint over top of the roofer's tape so that we didn't look, we looked, I think that's how we got our support. We looked like the most picked people you could ever imagine. We show up at the first church, and the pastor says, Brother Putney, you can put your motor home uh, right in front of the church door um, and run the extension cord inside, and then you'll have power tonight. So we did that. We parked right in front of the church door, ran the extension cord in, inside, and then the next morning happened. I woke up, went outside to get my ironing board to get ready for church. It's about 8 o'clock in the morning. Church starts 9.30, something like that. And I smell this terrible smell, and I said, what is that smell? And I look underneath of the motorhome, and my sewage system had rattled apart on the way up there. And my black water sewage tank drained all of its contents onto the sidewalk right in front of the front door of the church, right before church service. The pastor told me, Brother Putney, I've heard the term, this missionary stinks, but you put new meaning to that term. <laughs> Folks, God brought us to a place where we were desperately trusting in him. We didn't have the money to fix our motor home. We didn't have any of the means to do it on our own. We just said, Lord, you've commanded us to go to Columbia. We're giving ourselves to you. What are we going to do? You know what? God came through. Amen. That church took us on for support. <laughs> I have no idea why, but they did. We, we finished deputation very quickly. The Lord just provided. He just took care of it, but it was because that's what he does. But he's going to put you through some fire. He's going to try your faith. He's going to take you to that stone. He's going to tell you, move the stone. But you have to respond and trust. Faith will often involve risk. Second thing, quickly, is in Matthew chapter number 13. Turn with me there, please. Matthew chapter 13. Very... Very interesting verse in the Bible. I think we should all pay very much attention to. Matthew chapter 13, verse number 58. The Bible says this, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, Matthew 13, 58. The Bible says, And he, speaking of Christ, did not many mighty works there, because the economy was bad. That's what they told me in 2012. You can't do deputation right now. The economy's bad. Because they didn't have enough workers. Because the opposition was so strong. Because nobody wants to hear about the Bible anymore. Why? It says because of their unbelief. Second principle of faith that I've learned is unbelief hinders God's work. It hinders it in my life and it hinders it in our church. Unbelief hinders God's work. Jesus chose not to work because of unbelief. Folks, there are few things that frustrate God like unbelief. Very few things. I think of the children of Israel when they went to, uh, they, they left Egypt and God just does miracle after miracle after miracle for them. Destroying the most powerful army, the Egyptian army, right in front of their eyes in the, in the Red Sea. Taking them, feeding them with manna from heaven. And yet every single time something difficult would happen, they would respond with unbelief. They finally reach the, the border of the promised land, and they decide to send in 12 spies. Ten of them come back and say, hey, it's too hard. We can't win. And they were right. They couldn't win. But God had just got done destroying the most powerful army in the world without even raising a sword. God can win. And he said, we're going into the promised land. And they said, we can't, we won't, we, we, don't, we can't do this. They responded in unbelief. And you know what happened? The Lord said, okay, you don't want to go in. I'll bring, I'm still going to do what my plan is. I'm still going to fulfill my promises. I'm bringing your children in. You, however, are going to walk around aimlessly in the desert until every single one of you, minus Joshua and Caleb, are dead. Your carcasses are going to fall in the wilderness. Don't you love the terminology the Bible uses? <laughs> the Lord just said, you're, you're done. Why? Because of unbelief. 
God still did what he wanted to do, but they missed out on it. And that's what he does, folks. He doesn't need you and I. If God wants to reach Columbia, he can do it without me. If I respond in unbelief, guess who misses out? I do. You do as well. Folks, God requires us to have faith. And oftentimes, our unbelief destroys our own spiritual life. There's so many Christians, they sit in a pew and they just rot in this spiritual immaturity year after year after year because somewhere some along the line, they just refuse to trust God. God. You can't move forward without that faith. You have to trust him. And you may try to bypass a trial. Have you ever had God, have you ever had a, 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 a spiritual, um, uh, you know, what do you call it? When those, uh, when the, a hurdle, I'm sorry, a spiritual hurdle. I got Spanish brain. I'm sorry. You ever had a spiritual hurdle in your life, and you, instead of doing what you know you need to do, you kind of go around? And then you find about six months later, God does the exact same thing, puts the exact same type of hurdle in front of you, because you have to cross them, folks. You can't bypass them. You got to go over. And God does that. He'll bring us to those places, but there's many Christians. They've been just sitting in front of some hurdle for, for year after year after year because they, they refuse to step out in faith and trust God. And also, not only does it destroy our own spiritual life, it destroys your church too. I'm a, I'm a missionary, but I'm also a pastor. And I know that whenever God wants to lead our church in some direction, he, he gives me direction in that. Okay. God's going to speak to your pastor. God's going to lead your pastor. And then you get up to the church and you explain to the church, church, the Lord wants us to do this, whether it be starting some ministry, moving forward in something. And there's always somebody in the church that's going to fold their arms and say, well, that'll never work. That'll never work, people. And then they lean over to their neighbor and to try to explain to them why that will never work. What I find so interesting is those ten spies, their unbelief affected the entire congregation of Israel. And that's what happens in a church as well. Your unbelief will hurt your church. God has given you a pastor to lead you forward, and he expects you to follow your pastor. And what is not sin, you need to get behind your pastor. And your pastor is going gonna, is gonna to be leading the church forward and you are responsible to have faith. It's not enough for just him to have faith. You have to have faith as well. And when the church has that faith, God will move that church forward. But how sad it would be if it's said of your home or your church, he did not many mighty works there because of unbelief. Last thing, Hebrews 11. We'll finish it there. Hebrews chapter 11. The last principle about faith. is this, you cannot please God without faith. You just can't. Hebrews 11, verse number 6. The Bible says, but without faith it is difficult to please Him, challenging to please Him, harder to please Him. No, impossible to please Him. You know what that means? That means that if you're not living your life in faith, by faith, uh, you're not pleasing God. I'm sorry, just, just showing up for church is not, it's not doing it for the Lord. He wants your life lived in faith. And if it's not, it's impossible to please Him. The Bible tells us what it is that we need to believe. Right here in the verse, he says, he that cometh to God must believe that he is. God is. He is. He is. What is too hard for him? He's God. He's the creator of the universe. He can do anything. He is. Sometimes people come up to us and they'll say, oh, boy, I sure hope God can take care of you guys. You and your family in Colombia. I can tell you, God's not breaking a sweat taking care of us in Colombia. He's not. He's not up in heaven worried about how am I going to take care of this need for, my, for you or me or any of us. Right. He is. He's in control. Right. And we can trust him. And the day-to-day -day difficulties that come into our lives, remember, God is. He's, he's God. He's the author of time. He knows how it's going to work out. He's already planned it out. 
And he's probably intentionally allowed that trial into your life to see how you're going to respond. In faith or in unbelief. And notice what it says here, the last part of the verse. He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, this is one of my favorite parts of the Bible is this verse. He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I am not someone that ever thought I would be on the mission field. Okay? I am, uh, as, a, as, a young, as a young person, last thing I ever wanted to do was be a missionary. When I was 13 years old, I remember I was at a missions conference, and a missionary to Uganda was there. And he showed a, a slide presentation about Uganda. And I remember looking at those, those dirty streets of Uganda, third world country streets, thinking to myself, the worst thing in the world I could ever imagine is if God were to call me to go to a place like that. <laughs> I thought that. I thought the worst thing I could ever imagine happening is if I had to go to a place like that. Years later, the Lord worked in my heart got me to surrender to whatever he wanted. And then, when I was 18 years old, he called me to be a missionary. Had other plans for my life, but I was surrendered to his will. I said, Lord, I'll do whatever you want me to do. And God began to change my heart. Last July, I was, on, I was in the Amazon, and I told you a little bit about our Amazon trips that we do and working with uh, the group that goes down there, the medical team. And uh, I run, um, I, myself and one of my missionary friend, Mark Garrison, we go down um, in July and May every year, and we run the evangelism team. And so we, we organize and lead the team that does the evangelism. And what we do is we have part of the group, uh, when, when someone comes to the clinic, they go into a big waiting room area, and there's, there's a big crowd of people, and we just preach the gospel all day long. So it's just, you know, maybe some songs, some activities for the kids, salvation message. Songs, activities for the kids, salvation message. Just all day long. Just imagine a VBS-style thing all day long, preaching the gospel. So they, they sit out there for several hours, hear the gospel, and then they come into the waiting room after they're triaged. They sit in the waiting room, and then we have people that will go one-on-one -on -one with them and will witness to them individually after they've been in, in the main service for a number of, uh, a while. So I, I was working a shift in the individual area, and I was going one-on-one -on -one witnessing to people, and I'd just gotten done spending about 30 minutes with two men, and I witnessed to them, and they were very intent, and, and after about 30 minutes, they both wanted to receive the Lord. And so I prayed with them, and they were I was rejoicing with them, and I had noticed that while the two men sitting here, someone over... There was another man who was very intently listening in on our conversation. And so, I, I mean, the whole time, he was just... He was just engaged with what, what I was saying. And so after I got done witnessing to them and I finished with them, I walked over to him and I said, Sir, uh, I noticed that you were listening to our conversation a little bit. I said, Can I ask you, do you know for sure where you're going when you die? And, and he just got a big smile on his face and he said, I'm going to heaven. And I said, Well, why do you believe that? And he said, Because I just received Jesus as my Savior. Amen. He said, I was listening the whole time to you talking to those other men over there. And he said, And everything you said, I needed that and, and I, needed, I need to be saved. Amen. And so I try, when you prayed with them, I prayed too, and I got saved. I know I'm saved now. Amen. And I just rejoiced with him. His name was Miguel. We rejoiced together. I, I tried to uh, hook him up with the person who was going to be doing a Bible study in that village. And just to keep in mind, this village, they had, oh, they had previously been closed to missionaries. There was about 1,000 people there. It's called The village name is San Francisco. And 1,000 people in that village right on the Amazon River. You've got to take a boat to it. And they had always said, no missionaries, no missionaries, no missionaries. Well, we come and say, we have a free medical clinic, and we're bringing missionaries. You want us to come? And they, would, they, they told us, no, we, bring the medical clinic, bring the doctors. We need the doctors, but no missionaries. And we said, no missionaries, no doctors. Guess what? They got the missionaries. <laughs> so they said, fine, come on in, bring the missionaries. And uh, so we went in there, and they had a, a priest who was telling everyone that we were going to tattoo 666 on their foreheads and stuff. I mean, it was just nuts, the stuff that he was saying. But anyways, so we go in there, and, and so this is a, a place that is kind of hostile to the gospel. At the end of the day, they said, we'd like your whole team to come to the middle of the village. And the chief wants to come out, and he wants to tell you thank you for coming and wants to, wants to say some words to you. So we go out, and we're waiting for him. And all of a sudden, the ch sudden, the chief comes out. And I looked over, and it was Miguel. 
the chief was the guy that got saved, <laughs> listening in to me witnessing to those two guys. Amen. And he, was, he had a big smile on his face. He's telling us, thank you so much for coming. I'm, I'm translating for him, for the rest of the group. And he was just so excited. And I remember that at the end of the day, as we were heading back to the village that we were sleeping in, I'm on the boat, kind of quiet Amazon River, sun setting, jungles going by, only the sound of the motor. And I'm just reflecting on what the Lord had done that day, just kind of rejoicing in my heart. And I'm just watching the river, and I've had two thoughts. I th first thought I thought was, what am I doing here? I was that little boy sitting in the missions conference, terrified that God would ever send him to some third world mission field. Absolutely terrified. And then the second thought was, why am I having so much fun? Because I thought that it would be the most horrible thing in the world. But I learned something, that part where it says, he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You know what happens when you live the life by faith, when you seek God? He changes your desires. Right. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he will give thee the desires of thine heart. You know what he does? He changes your desires so that they are his desires. Amen. And can I tell you, the greatest thing in the world is get to do stuff like that. Amen. Get to be a missionary. I love being a missionary. Say, are there hard parts about being a missionary? There's, there's all kinds of hard stuff about being a missionary. But can I tell you, there's no greater thing in the world. I wouldn't trade with anybody. Amen. I wouldn't trade with anybody. What a, it is such a blessing. Amen. And you say, well, why is that? Because God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Amen. That's where God wants to bring you. Someone once said to me after a meeting, and be careful what you say to the missionaries back there by the table because you could end up as a sermon illustration in their next sermon. <laughs> Someone once said to me after the meeting, they said, I'm sure glad that it's you guys going to Columbia and not my kids. Can I tell you something? She's missed this completely. Absolutely. What I just got done talk, explaining to you, it's doesn't get it. He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Whatever God has for you to do in this life, if you, it, it, it doesn't matter what you do, what your profession is. It really doesn't matter what your profession is. We're all supposed to be living our lives toward reaching people for Christ, fulfilling the Great Commission, helping our church. That's the purpose of our life. If you're not living your life for that, you're wasting your life. Okay, you are. But... Whatever way that you, God has you plugged in, live your life by faith. Amen. And whatever step of faith that God wants you to take, maybe there's something in your church that God wants you to do, God wants you to start helping in, God wants you to wade, wade into that deep water, kind of like Peter, step out of the boat. Yep. Maybe it's time that you throw, stop with your excuses, stop with your disobedience, stop with your unbelief, and obey. And obey. Maybe you are living your life by faith, but you're getting discouraged because you're going through some hard times. Can I just encourage you? Just keep walking by faith. God's in control. He's in control. And he wants to help you. But you got to trust him. Maybe you're here tonight and you're without Christ. You're also saved by faith. Not by works, but by putting your faith in him. At the end of the service, I just want to invite you to come and talk with someone afterward. Talk with me or pastor. And, and we can help you receive Christ as your Savior tonight. Don't leave here tonight without Jesus Christ. Amen.